Good morning. It's seven minutes after 10 on Friday. That means it's time for the Real Estate Fix with Rich. I'm your host, Rich Sherman. Thank you for tuning in to KHTS 98.1 FM, AM 1220, your hometown station. Oh boy, we've got a lot of stuff to go over t- uh, today. Uh, but we're going to kind of, we're going to keep the show, the show's going to be a little different today. We're going to do kind of one topic show today. We're going to go over some stuff real quickly as far as the market and things like that. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about zombie seconds. And I'll tell you why as we get into it. Uh, but before I get started, as always, disclaimer, especially for today's show, the opinions I present are my own. I am not an attorney. I am a realtor in Santa Clarita Valley in, the Southern, Cal- in Southern California. I uh, have been doing this. I've been doing pro bono foreclosure defense for people and fixing all manner of real estate problems for free for uh, 33 years. And uh, zombie seconds are one that's near and dear to my heart. And I've been dealing with those, another one of those things that's before since we had a name for them. Um... I, we actually, a friend of mine and I kind of helped coin the term zombie seconds, as a matter of fact. That's how long we've been into this. So there's there's a lot to talk about about it. There's a lot of bad information out there. And we have a special guest today who's going through this. He's a new client in my office. And I thought his story was really an excellent one and one worth telling because uh, he's he's not the, he's not a, a slipshot kind of guy. He's a very careful sort of methodical sort of person, very together kind of guy. You'll hear him when he comes on. His name is Joe, and he's got a heck of a story to tell. And we're going to get into that today as sort of an exemplar of what goes on with these zombie seconds because it can happen to anyone. It has nothing to do with your level of education or how much you know or how to deal with mortgages or your level of experience. Um, and when you hear his story, you'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But let's talk about the market just a little bit before we spend the rest of the show talking about zombie seconds. So just real briefly... Um, we, the Fed, as predicted, I kind of I called that one, unfortunately. The Fed is raising, I'm not alone, a lot of people did. The Fed raised the interest rate by another quarter percent uh, two days ago. I really wish they would stop doing that. I think we all would. That is the bad news because they are still trying to crush inflation. And when the Fed talks about crushing inflation, understand that one of the biggest markets they're talking about is housing. The Fed is very, very disappointed that the housing market has continued to go up. And the reason for that is because there's so little inventory on the market. And the reason for that is because 70% of all mortgages in the United States right now, because of the very, very low interest rates during the pandemic, are sub 4%. So if you have a mortgage that's below 4%, you're not going to give that up and go buy a house unless you have to, unless there's some other intervening thing. So there's a whole series of people who otherwise would sell who are not. That is keeping inventory low because inventory is low and we live in an area that does have high, uh, high desirability. Uh, Southern California, Santa Cruz Valley in particular, uh, prices are, are still high. So we have not seen the same kind of reduction in prices that they've seen elsewhere. We will. It'll always catch up to us. Uh, but it's going to be a while. Now, that's the, that's the news as far as that's concerned. The good news with the interest rate is that despite the fact that the Fed raised it a quarter of a point, the mortgage interest rate has barely skittered up at all. It went up just a tiny, tiny bit. Your average right now uh, in, in the United States for somebody with decent credit is about uh, 6 and 6.85, something like that, where it was about 6.79 a week ago. So not a huge difference in the mortgage rate, but I mean, enough to enough to pay attention to, but it hasn't gone up nearly as much as the Fed, uh, I think, would like it to. So uh, I've got an article here I want to read to you guys. It comes from Investopedia. Uh, from the, uh, it's talking about home sales to slow, prices fall, says Realtor.com. And I like Realtor.com. I pay attention to them and Redfin, and just like I do the Board of Realtors. And anyone who wants to put data out into the market, I like to pay attention to. But Realtor.com, God darn it, they just, they just seem to always have it wrong. I don't know if it's their forecasting is that bad, or they just have so much data they can't kind of quote through it. But let me just read this to you. Heading into the second half of 2023, the U.S. housing market has yet to see the typical spring and summer boom as limited inventory and high borrowing costs dampen the market. All stuff we've been talking about since long before summer started. Uh, mortgage rates are elevated, leading to low inventory as many potential buyers wait for rates to drop before looking for a new home. Would-be sellers uh, would be with cheap mortgages are holding off, unwilling to go back into the market and paying more. And I take issue with that a little bit because while the second half of that about sellers not coming into the market is absolutely true nationwide, saying that mortgage rates are elevated and, and that is leading to low inventory, I don't necessarily agree with. I think the low inventory is because of the, the second statement, which is about the lower interest rates. But anyway, uh, as a result, sales have dropped according to analysis by Realtor.com. Uh, doesn't take much to do that analysis. We've been talking about the real estate market as a whole, as far as volume is concerned, is shrinking. It is down about 40% year over year from this time last year to now. That means there are 40% fewer houses being sold, 40% houses being bought, fewer houses being bought, etc. Um, and it's a shrinking market. It's a war between supply and demand. And right now, demand is lower than, sorry, supply is coming up shorter than demand. And that's what's keeping our, our prices higher. But anyway, back to Realtor.com. Uh, the biggest factor cooling the markets is more, or is the biggest factor cooling the market market is mortgage rates, according to Realtor.com. Rates are expected to end the year near the 6% mark. Boy, I hope that's right. Pending further rate hikes from the Federal Reserve, with rates that uh, if rates uh, that high, sales are expected to slow, dropping 15.8% for the year. 
again, the market's already down almost 40% nationwide. So while I think it's great that they think the market's going to dip 15.8%, they're not talking about uh, sales prices. They're talking about the number of sales. And I just think that's ridiculous. The number of sales is year over year between 2022 to 23, uh, as far as volume, is going to be a lot lower than a 15.8%, or sorry, excuse me, a lot higher than a 14.8% drop. 15.8% drop. It's going to be much higher. Home prices will fall 0.6% year over year by the time 2024 rolls around, according to Realtor.com. Now, Realtor.com originally anticipated that home prices would go up this year by 5.4%. So now they're saying they're going to go down by 0.6%. And again, anyone who wants to put data out there, thank you. I appreciate it, Realtor.com. But you guys are just so often wrong. At the beginning of this year, I was saying the prices are going to come down about another 5% by the end of the year. They had already come down at that point about 15%. We were going to lose 20 overall. And that's exactly what's going on. Uh, and in most markets, you're seeing drops like crazy. We talked about that uh, week par in weeks past. Southern California, we're holding it together very, better than most. So is our places like New York and other places that are, you know, high uh, high visibility, high uh, desirably er desirable areas because of a lack of inventory. But for them to have a, a, a switch of over 6%, uh, in their forecasting over the course of six months kind of calls into account their, their forecasting. But anyway, um, mortgage rates, larger economic trends determining the market, stuff they're all talking about. With well, a weakened market, sales expected to slip. Uh, again, they're already slipping. So, I mean, you can repeat that 15.8% figure if they'd like, but the reality is the Fed has raised the rate from five and a quarter, the Fed has raised the rate another quarter of a percent. So we're now at five and a quarter to five and a half as far as the Fed's lending rate. That is... A quarter point raise makes it the highest rate the Fed has had in 22 years. So it was the turn of the century the last time the Fed had a rate this high. Um, luckily, the mortgage market isn't up a bit, but when the Fed raises the rate 11 times, and what is it, I think it's March of last year it started? So in just over 12 months, they've raised the rate 11 times, and I'm here to tell you they're going to do it a 12th. That is not necessarily good news for the real estate market. I mean, it, I don't want to get too off on my own subject, which is real estate, although it is called the the fix with rich we're talking about real estate um and I, you know they're also going after the price of milk and eggs and gold and everything else because they're trying to keep inflation down because the fed has a two percent target now the good news is the inflation has come down a bit we're looking around three percent now three and a half depending on who you ask so depending on what part of the market you look at so that's pretty good but the fed just is not going to let off the the raising rate pedal i just have a feeling we're looking at another one of these i just have a feeling they're going to go ahead and raise the rate at least one more time at least another quarter point by the end of the year now whether that affects the um mortgage market, whether that affects the interest rate, as far as the rise of the interest rate, I don't know, we'll see. That has more to do with the stock market than it does with the Fed, but they all are kind of interwoven. So that's kind of the mortgage market as it's at, that's kind of the real estate market as it's at, not a whole lot of change. Uh, and one last thing before I go on into the mortgage, mar the uh, zombie second thing, um, I was out last week, those of you who know, uh, no, I was out, didn't do the show last week, which is not like me, I, I never try to miss, I try never to miss a show, I like the opportunity to do this and have a fun time doing it, uh, and I hope you guys like it, but um, I was out last week because I have a bit of a health concern, and so I wanted to say a quick thank you to the good folks at Henry Mayo New Hall Memorial Hospital for helping me get back on my feet and back out the door and back to uh, back to working condition, so much better to be up and about than, than in bed, so thank you to those guys, I appreciate it. Um, anyway, uh, let's get back to this, let's talk about zombie mortgages, so I will tell you, when I prep for a show, usually between my uh, my lovely wife who helps with a lot of this stuff and my staff and everything, we put about six to eight hours a week into putting, producing and putting together the show for you. And when it came to the topic of zombie mortgages, which I really wanted to talk about uh, this week, especially with some time off to think about it, um, there wasn't a whole lot of prep time necessary because I've been living this stuff and everybody around me who works for me and certainly my wife who lives with me is a real estate attorney, as you guys know. Uh, we've been living the eating and breathing this stuff for over 20 years. So first of all, let's start with what is a zombie mortgage. Uh, a zombie mortgage, they're typically junior liens, usually second mortgages, uh, that have come out of the past. You thought they were dead. You thought they were gone. You thought they were buried. Uh, and they've come out of the past to come up from the ground to haunt property owners and threaten their homes. That's, that is what a zombie mortgage is. A mortgage you thought that was dead, a mortgage you thought that was no more, um, you know, there, it's just a loan that sort of lingers in limbo, neither fully paid off nor foreclosed. It just sort of sits there. And they are incredibly dangerous because people think they're gone, they don't know they're around, and they just pop up and they, they destroy people. They are absolutely devastating, and they should not be allowed. Zombie mortgages should not exist. Now, before we get too far into how to, how to deal with zombie mortgages, how they're generated and all that good stuff, we're going to cover all of that today. Uh, this is going to be a pretty thorough class on the subject of, of zombie mortgages. And the reason, I want you guys to know the reason I'm doing this, and I'm doing it this way because I have the platform to do it and I feel a responsibility to and it's a subject that I know extraordinarily well. So this is why I'm doing it this way. We're doing the whole show on zombie mortgages today and the reason for that is this will turn into a YouTube video that will go up and become a resource for people going forward as we do with all the shows. 
And in doing some research for this show, just a little bit that I had to do and talking to some other clients uh, about what they've been seeing, there is some horrendously bad advice out there on this topic. Uh, there are some YouTube videos from people who should darn sure know better, some attorneys and things in other parts of the country. There are a lot of financial advisors, a lot of self-serving realtors out there uh, who think they know, first of all, what a zombie mortgage is, and in a lot of cases, they don't. And more importantly, most of them don't offer a remedy. They just say, this is a zombie mortgage and it is bad. Well, I think we can all agree on that. But if you don't offer a remedy, what use are you? Or worse yet, if you offer a remedy that is woefully incorrect. I mean, nobody's perfect. I'm certainly, I'll be the first one to tell you. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. I'm not always right, but I'm right more than I'm, than I'm wrong. And I'm right more than most people you know about real estate. That's just my thing. What can I tell you? I like it. I love it. I've been doing it for 33 years. I do know what I'm talking about. And I'm always up for learning new things. But there's a horrendous amount of misinformation out there. And so we're going to clarify a lot of that today. So a zombie mortgage is a mortgage you thought was dead and buried. It was gone. That has now come back to life. So the first thing let's talk about is what gen where do they come from? What creates a zombie mortgage? Well, I've been dealing with zombie mortgages. The first one I saw was in 2002, so that's even before the, sub the uh, uh, subprime crisis of 2008, the Great Recession of 2008, 9, and 10. But most of them we're seeing these days were generated in 2008, 9, and 10. And what they were was it was very popular to do mortgages during that period of time, if you remember, that were called 80-20. They were 100% loans. They were 80% first, 20% second. And they came from the same bank most of the time. Wells Fargo did a ton of these. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of banks did. Countrywide did a ton of them. They were very popular. And so what happened then is to a lot of people is they, hit, they had some financial hard times. We, a lot of us did uh, in 2008, 9, and 10, uh, and 12, uh, 11, and 12. And they went to the bank and they got a loan modification. And they thought as a result of the loan modification, because it was with the same bank, that both loans were, were covered in the loan mod because they didn't think of them as two loans. Well, I'm here to tell you they are two loans, and most of them did not get dealt with. And the other problem that compounds this is then the lenders didn't do anything with the loan. They just sat on the loans. And when I say sat on the loans, I mean for decades in some cases. Um, it is kind of ridiculous that they've been allowed to do. I mean, if you owe me money and I make no attempt to collect it for, oh, I don't know, a decade, I think it's fair for you to say that, I don't owe you that you don't owe me money anymore. If I've done nothing to collect. But that's not the way it works in mortgages. And the law in the state of California on the subject has become so perverted uh, to what its purpose originally was that it's almost impossible to reach a statute of limitations on a mortgage debt. And that's why we have this the secondary market, and that's why we have zombie seconds. So you have a loan. We're going to talk to Joe when he comes on. We're going to talk to him about his story. But you have a loan that in some cases you are told is charged off. In some cases you get a letter that says your loan has been charged off. No further payments are necessary. Or you get a letter like in Joe's case saying the lien is being uh, removed. And yet it doesn't actually mean that which is completely ridiculous. If you cannot rely on what your bank tells you, then how are you supposed to manage the mortgage? And that's really what this comes down to. Because the bank, some of them went out of business, but a lot of them just went silent. Uh, and the reason for that is pretty simple. There, there was no point going after a second. I mean, if you owed $500,000 on a house and you had $100,000 second, and the house was only worth 400,000, there was no point in them coming after you for that second. And if you manage to keep that house out of foreclosure, get a loan modification, file bankruptcy, what have you, and you manage to save the house, the second just went quiet. Because again, you owed $500,000 on a house that wasn't worth that much. Certainly wasn't enough, uh, worth enough to cover the second, so why would, they, why would they foreclose or do anything? And so they sat, and they waited, and they just lied in wait. And then it gets worse, because then they turned around and sold these loans in the secondary market to what are called debt buyers. And then the debt buyers come back and they act as if they won the freaking lottery because now they're gonna collect on your house. And you just get a letter in the mail that says, hey, by the way, you owe us, uh, in Joe's case, you owe us $66,000. Kindly cut us a check today. And if you don't do it within 90 days, we're gonna foreclose. I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And everyone goes through the same process. First, they think that it can't be right because it was dealt with years ago. And then it sinks in that it is right, or they talk to a real estate attorney or, or me or someone else, title company, uh, escrow, whatever, and they tell them, no, the debt does exist, it's on your title, and they freak out a little, and they kind of in internalize that. Then they contact the bank, because it can't be that high, right? You can't keep charging me interest on a debt that you've done nothing to collect on over, for over a decade. No, actually they can, and they will, and they do. So now your debt that was maybe originally 50000 might be 150000 Heck, we got one in the office, it's 12.5% interest, it's over 200000 Started as a $50,000 debt, that's crazy. Uh, and now there's the equity in the property. And to make matters worse, to compound it, when you pay your first mortgage, because you didn't know there was a second hanging out there for you, or a third or whatever it is, when you pay your other liens, you create more equity in your house for them to come after you. So you actually set yourself up for them to come get you. So we're going to talk about all this good stuff. We're going to go to break now, listen to some of our, uh, our wonderful uh, sponsors. And then when we come back, thank them for sponsoring. We need their help to do the show. We appreciate it. When we come back, we're going to have Joe on the phone. We're going to talk to him about his situation. He's going to tell you his story. And it's, it's a heck of a story. And I want you guys to hear it because it's important, especially if you're dealing with a zombie mortgage or if you're dealing with one in the future. 
This is a good story to hear because it is absolutely an exemplar of the kind of stuff that we see on a daily basis. We probably have 20 or 30 of these in the office now. I'd have to count them up. We have quite a few. Uh, we certainly dealt with a lot more than that. So I'm Rich Sherman, your host of uh, The Real Estate Fix with Rich on KHTS 98.1 FM, AM 1220, your hometown station. And we're going to listen to some uh, some uh, advertisers. We're going to come back. We're going to hear Joe's story when we come back. Hang in there with me. I'll try, I promise you it'll be worth it. Hello, welcome back. You're listening to The Fix with Rich on KHTS 98.1 FM, AM 1220, your home station. And we've been talking today all about zombie mortgages, zombie liens on a house, loans that come back from the dead to eat your equity. Uh, and we call them zombies because they are vicious and they are horrible. Unfortunately, zombies are fictional and these are not. These are real zombies and they are very, very dangerous. And uh, on the line today we have uh, Joe, who is a new client to the office. He called in, what, about a week or two ago, I suppose? So he just got his case. Uh, and I wanted you guys to talk to, I wanted you guys to hear Joe's story because it, it really is, first of all, it's a heck of a story. Uh, and I will tell you, rarely do we get clients who are this, well, for lack of a better word, credible. Not that all of our clients are credible. We love our clients. We believe them, certainly. But most of the time when a client says they have paperwork or they got paperwork or one time they had paperwork, they can really pr produce it. Um, often they're, they're recollections of the events because we are talking sometimes, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, in this case, I think it's about 11 years ago, 12 years ago. So uh, it became a little murky. But i got to tell you, in Joe's case, boy, he is just, well, you're going to hear him in a second. He is just absolutely on the mark with all this stuff, and he has all the documentation to to prove it. And uh, so, we're, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little. So, Joe, are you in line with us? Can you hear me? Uh, good morning, Rich. Yes, hey, good morning, Joe. Welcome to the show. Thank you for calling in. I appreciate it. So I wanted the people to hear your story a little bit. And before we do, let's lay a little bit of foundation. Um, first of all, let's let people know that you are uh, former law enforcement. You had yes. a pretty pretty serious job. We didn't know exactly what it was. We had a pretty serious job there. Um, you're not in Southern California. You're actually in Sacramento. Uh, you also have a real estate license, so you so you're much more educated, both between your law enforcement background and uh, and having a real estate license yourself. You're much better educated to this topic than most people, uh, and you keep impeccable records. Which again, thank you. you know, I've talked about that many times. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> makes my life my my uh, work a lot easier. Why don't you tell the folks a little bit? Just tell them your story. Tell them kind of what happened. Tell tell them a little synopsis sure. of what's going on with you. Sure, absolutely. So, yeah, as we all know, back during the uh, Great Recession, as they called it, everyone's going through a, a huge financial difficulty, myself included. You know, I was in the department for about, say, 15 years at the time. And yeah, there were actually talks about layoffs for folks. And there was actually some uh, law enforcement officers that were actually laid off after uh, 10 years of service. So, uh, nonetheless, you know, I, I had to do something to try to get this uh, financial situation rectified on my end. There was no more overtime, what have you. So, my income had been reduced. In, a, in so other words, you short, step. In other words, you step forward to do the responsible thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So I reached out to um, uh, uh, you know uh, find legal counsel. I had it, unfortunately filed bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. But in, during the bankruptcy process, uh, after I got a discharge, I reached out to Bank of America and, and said, "Look, I, I want to keep my home for my family. I have a first and a second mortgage. Please help me with the loan modification." The Bank of America uh, was your I lender. Had actually, you, you, you had only a first and a second. And they were both with B of A. That's correct. Okay. So, uh, anyways, as everyone knows, it's very difficult to get a hold of anybody at that time. So, I had to actually call corporate and, and then finally got a call back from the gentleman said corporate asked me to call you. So, I, I jotted down everything he needed uh, to the T and uh, sent him all the documentation needed to the letter, uh, uh, the law, if you will, and constantly, constantly contacted them, emailed, what have you. And they finally um, uh, got some documents, you know, and uh, the loan modification. I said, excellent. So I, I get the documents, and I, I read through it, and I was like, okay, I, I see all this information. I said, well, I'm trying to get a hold of the uh, gentleman. So, well, I asked a few questions, but again, I couldn't get a hold of him, and I had a timeline in order to get this uh, taken care of. Yeah, is, isn't that nice? They give you a timeline to respond. You have to do it by this, or the deal's no good, and yet they can't answer any questions or tell you what it is. So hopefully you have a legal background and have a mortgage background, and you can digest these things, because otherwise you just got to kind of guess. Also, before I go on, I want to point out to people that you did this on your own. You got your own loan modification in 2012. Um, and just, and I don't know if you know the statistic here, Joe, but um, at the time, because these are statistics that are near and dear to my heart, if you were going to do a loan modification by yourself, because of some of the things you talked about, uh, not being able to get a hold of the bank, et cetera, uh, uh, different guidelines, whatever, uh, your odds of success were 8%. So you had a 92% chance of failure. And most right. people obviously failed. And you managed to get a, 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 a modification, not just a modification, but a first responder's modification because of your career. Correct. Okay, so I just want to make sure people knew that. But go on. Okay. All right, so uh, once I got that sent off, I continued to contact them. I just wanted to clarify that uh, my second was included in this. Couldn't get any response from anybody at all. A short time later, I received this letter from Bank of America that said, congratulations, your loan's paid in full, and a lien cancellation is in the process of completion. I'm like, oh, great. Okay, so it's all taken care of. 
uh, no further communications from Bank of America. And fast forward 10 years later, I get this letter from Arch Mortgage that you owe me uh, $66,500. Of yeah, course, being in law enforcement, I think this is maybe some kind of scam, so I do my due diligence and send a like letter and what have you. Yeah. And they send me some documentation saying that uh, Bank of America had uh, transferred this loan to a company called United Guarantee and mm -hmm. subsequently transferred it to Arch Mortgage. Mm -hmm. And now they're the holder of this note. I'm like, mm -hmm. this can't be true. So that's when I started doing research and I, I started losing sleep again like I did back then over 10 years ago yeah. and I reached out to you after doing some yeah. research and then you've been a tremendous help in this oh, process so now we're in the process of trying to figure this out and with your help I'm hoping this will uh, go away so well, yeah, we, we, what, in my opinion you know I did everything I was supposed to do and from my research I found out these folks were just lying in wait yeah for 10 years yeah well in United Guarantee well let me, let me back up a little bit just so people understand first of all I'm actually holding in my hand uh, a copy of the letter that Joe received from Bank of America uh, in, er, in uh, mid-2013. And what it says, and you cannot miss it, the cancellation of lien on for your mortgage is in the process of completion. Now, Bank of America is going to hang their hat, no doubt, on the process of completion part of that sentence. But I think if your bank sends you a letter like this and you do not get any sort of follow-up, you're reaching out to them, asking them if this means what you think it means, and you get no response, I don't think it is unreasonable to suggest that the consumer can rely, reasonably rely, on Bank of America's last communication that the cancellation of the lien will be done, will be completed. Now, what Bank of America didn't tell you, Joe, and what you now know, and what I want to make sure the audience understands is United Guarantee is an insurance company. An insurance company, so... Well, what's the word I'm looking here for? I'm looking for here that will avoid some liability. Um, hmm. Curiously run. Let's put it to you that way. I don't think there's a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of paying attention to what the laws are on certain subjects inside of that company at the time, and I know that because they got in all kinds of trouble, and they were told you guys can't do business like this for another ten years. They were prohibited by the Department of Justice for operating, from taking mortgages, for time to collect mortgages for 10 years. And it's 2013, 2023 now, and it was 2022 when that was issued. So that is why, unfortunately, they were as quiet as they were and why you've walked into their crosshairs now. Also, what they did, and this is just a clever little thing that, you know, had too cute by, by half, uh, United Guarantee opened another, more, another company called Arch Mortgage. United Guarantee is Arch Mortgage. Arch Mortgage is a wholly owned subsidiary of United Guarantee Mortgage, essentially. They created another company. They have this, as you were the first to point out, Joe, they have the exact same address in Huntington Beach. Why all these places are in, are in curiously well-funded storefronts in Huntington Beach and Laguna, I have no idea, but boy, that's a popular place for this. Anyway, I guess they like the weather. Anyway, um, so yeah, so United Guarantee was supposed to pay off this mortgage as an insurance claim. And what they did instead was they took back the mortgage and they just sort of had it transferred to them as an insurance claim. And that's really not what they're supposed to do. And in fact, what they got in trouble for doing, what they were banned from doing evermore or for at least 10 years, just after they apparently got your mortgage, which you didn't know anything about. So right. that is how we get from Bank of America to United Guarantee to Arch. And there's not a thing in there that makes a whole lot of sense. And also, they didn't bother to tell you at no point did they tell you, and this is common in these stories, at no point did they tell you, hey, by the way, United Guarantee now has your mortgage. You only found that out when you found out this debt existed from Arch and you back, and you went back into it and said, B of A, what's going on, right? Correct. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. So the question has to arise, you didn't even know the debt existed. How are you supposed to service a debt that you didn't know existed and that nobody said anything about? Because i got to tell you, Somebody owed me $66,000, and I'll, I don't know you well, but I'll speak on your behalf. I'm willing to bet if somebody owed you 66000 bucks, you'd call them. You'd send them the occasional letter. Hey, pal, how you doing? Where's my money? You would think something along those lines, maybe a little nicer than that, but something like that. But the bank doesn't bother to do that, and yet they still retain the ability not just to collect, but to sell the loan after charging it off, to sell the loan after they got an insurance payment out of it, and then to have the insurance company who's barred from doing this for a decade then turn around sell it to essentially themselves and then attempt to collect it at, at uh, the face value of the loan. Plus, back, pass some back interest and things like that as well they've talked on. In your case, it was originally a $50,000 loan. So, I mean, the morality of this is obviously corrupt. I mean, that, that's an obvious thing. I mean, there's, nobody is going to look at a situation like this and go, yeah, I think the bank should still have a right. You know, I'm not in the banking industry. I'm not in the mortgage industry. But yeah, sure, I still think any bank should have the right to collect a debt if you didn't pay it and they didn't do anything about contacting you for over a decade. Nobody's going to come to that conclusion on their own unless they work in mortgage banking, which is ridiculous. So... The facts are, you got a letter from your mortgage bank 
saying this is being discharged. This lien is, is going to be um, uh, uh, canceled, gone. And instead of canceling it, they sold it to somebody else without telling you. That company then sold it to a third company without telling you. And the third company is now attempting to collect. That's the story, and that's a very normal story. Actually, there are fewer uh, twists and turns in that story than there are in most uh, zombie second stories. So that is the situation. So you just get a letter in the mail from a company you've never heard of, uh, trying to enjoy your retirement, and instead you get a letter in the mail from a company you've never heard of saying, kindly cut us a check for 66 grand, please, or we're taking your house. Yes, the unfortunate scenario. That's that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Um, now I'm all for you borrow money, you pay money back. That's that's you know that's fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But when Bank of America can get a government bailout, when United Guarantee, despite being guilty of crimes, uh, can get a bailout, uh, create a, another company to go after the loan to begin uh, yet again, I don't see why the homeowner can't. I do not see why the homeowner can't. And one of the things that's been driving me crazy in doing research not just on your file, but on all the files we have like this, because I try to keep up on these things. And you've sent me some stuff as well, because you're, you're quite the researcher yourself, Joe. Um, there's so much bad information out there. Uh, I watched one this morning where the guy gets up there. It's about an eight-minute video, and he gets up there, and he basically, his theory is, no surprise, he's a mortgage banker. His theory is that if you owe the money, you should pay it back. Okay. And you should never get a loan mod. You should never look for a deferment or anything else. You can't afford the house. You should move. That's, the, that's crazy. That's your solution? Move? What if you spent 20 years in a house and you can't afford to live anyplace else? You should just move? I mean, that's, that's nonsense. All right, all right, there's uh, another one I saw last night where their brilliant suggestion was file bankruptcy. You did that. A bankruptcy does not relieve a second mortgage debt unless it's a Chapter 13, unless you filed for uh, the mortgage uh, to strip the mortgage, and unless the first over encumbers the property. You have to owe more on the first than the property is worth in order to strip junior liens. So no, a bankruptcy is not going to do any good either. So there's so much bad information out there, and we seek to fix that. That is kind of the point. So let tell so tell people a little bit, kind of where you tell them, kind of how you feel about it, where you're at now. So that now we have the facts of it. But, well, like I said, you know, I, I did my due diligence, and I was doing everything to be responsible and make sure I take care of my obligation. Mm -hmm. And uh, by by going through this process, you know, I, I feel like I'm being financially ambushed by the banks. You are. Uh, you know. I, I, yeah. So yeah, I work very hard to try to reestablish myself here and and the uh, financially, and uh, things were going great, and this all of a sudden occurred, and it, it's just been gut wrenching. I, I tell you, I'm losing sleep over this. Well, you're in effect being penalized for doing the right thing. Correct. Because had you just thrown your hands up in the air and walked away from the house, it would have gone to foreclosure, and you wouldn't have had this problem. But because you chose to right. get in front of the problem, because you chose to do the responsible thing, contact the bank and say, hey, I owe you this money. I have this obligation. Here's where I'm at. What can we do to work this out? Uh, and BFA didn't give you a loan mod out of the uh, kindness of their heart. They did it because it was in their financial interest to do so. They got money from the government, and they needed, to, they, they needed to sort out their own books. Because at the end of the day, a modification is always better for the bank than a foreclosure. It's a simple concept, because whatever business school you went to, this applies to everybody. 2% of something is still better than 100% of nothing. So continuing to service a loan, even at a 2% interest rate, is still better than foreclosing, in, unless there's a ton of equity in the property, and even then, you're only supposed to foreclose for what you're owed. So you are always better off as a bank, always better off as a mortgage investor, always better off keeping the person in the house, because you keep them paying. That's always the best way to do it. So it's not like they did you some great big favor by doing a loan modification. They lived up to their financial responsibility in that regard. You lived up to yours. The aggravating part here is that B of A did not live up to their responsibility with you in regards to the second mortgage. They simply didn't. They absolutely right. had a responsibility to you to keep you informed, to tell you what to keep to uh, tell you what was going on, and to act responsibly, and most importantly, to respond to your inquiries. And they never did any of that. Now. When we started this, I told you guys, uh, audience, that um, I was going to give you solutions to these problems as well. So I'm going to give you the first hint with solutions for this. There are three principal places you need to look if you have this kind of problem. The first one is something called RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. It's a federal law. You can Google it. It's super easy. If you call me, I'll be happy to point you in that direction. It's called RESPA, R-E-S-P-A, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. The other one you want to look at as is something called TILA the um, Truth in Lending uh, um, Act, T-I-L-A, Truth in Lending Act. Um, and then last but not least is the um, Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. 
And we're going to talk about that before the end of the show because that's changing a little. There is some, there's some light at the end of the tunnel here, not necessarily in California, but we're getting there. Uh, because inside the Fair Debt Co Collection Practices Act, there is a section called item F. And F dictates the amount of time a lender has to come after you for a defunct mortgage. And unfortunately, they re it reverts to what the state says. And in California, it's six years, but it's not strictly six years. We're going to get into that before the end of this, uh, before the end of it today. But at least there is some light, at least something is being done. Uh, there was a letter that went out uh, the end of last year from Congress. I think it was, um, as a matter of fact, uh, Joe, you sent me a copy of the letter. I think it was um, Sherrod Brown from Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, uh, sent a letter right. to the CFPB saying, uh, hey, this is going on. People are having their houses threatened over loans that are should have been dead and buried, i.e. zombies. Uh, that's why we call them that. And they're being threatened by this. We need to do something about this. Action needs to be taken. This isn't right. And the CFPB's response, the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, their response was to put out a notice uh, in April of this year saying that if you are, and this, this it's, it doesn't, it's not going to sound like a significant change, but I'll explain why, and it may inf impact your case too, Joe. Um, if you are a lender attempting to collect on a zombie second, we'll call it a zombie in, in lending circles, or, or in, for the CFPB, a zombie second, uh, or any zombie sort of mortgage, and um, you are statute if you are uh, beyond the point at which you statutorily are allowed to collect, mm. or that you're statutorily barred from collecting, and you try to collect, whether you knew it or not, you're in all kinds of trouble. And they haven't spelled out what that trouble is exactly. Uh, we're still waiting on a lot of that, but at least they're starting to bring some pressure on the more on these debt buyers in the mortgage industry. Because, you know, hey, at least yours is with Arch uh, Mortgage, which is semi-credible, is not credible as they are. They are semi-credible compared to some of these companies we deal with. Because uh, they're all just, they're, they're vulture capitalists. They're looking for a quick buck. They're, look, they're looking for a winning lottery ticket. Because when mm -hmm. loans get sold in the secondary market, and yours didn't, it just sort of got transferred through. Uh, but when loans get sold in the secondary market, they pay pennies on the dollar. Now, in your case, I promise you, on United Guarantees books, they do not have this as a $50,000 loan, which was the original loan amount. They do not have it as a $66,000 loan, which is what they're trying to collect on. Uh, they have it as some ridiculously discounted amount that they sold it, I'm making air quotes while I do that, to Arch Mortgage, which again is the same people, as a way to discount their tax rate on it. Uh, now, Arch probably paid, I don't know, 30, 40 cents on the dollar, if that, maybe as little as 10, because they were buying it from themselves, essentially. And unfortunately, you can't find out that information without a lawsuit and a subpoena. So as to what they paid for it. So we'll, we'll, we're going to get into that as well. But the statute of limitations thing is interesting because in some states, it's very simple. Like in uh, New Hampshire, it's five years period from the point of default. In California, however, we have something called, I just learned this, something called the, uh, let's see, my, my wife wrote it down for me and she wanted to make sure, because she's the attorney in the group, she wanted to make sure I didn't get it wrong. It's called the California Marketable Title Record Act. California's Marketable Title Record Act uh, of 1982, for those of you who want to look it up. And unfortunately, what it says is the statute of limitations only really applies, which is what the CFP is talking about, and this, this would apply to your case, Joe, if the loan is a, in a judicial foreclosure. I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole, but in California, like a lot of the states, especially the high-volume states, we are in what's called a non-judicial foreclosure state, which means that you do not necessarily have to go to a judge uh, and have a trial to foreclose. You simply post it with the court. The court, the court signs off on it. Those of you who remember the robo-signing scandal, this was at the heart of it. Uh, the idea is it's a streamlined system. And I'm all for streamlining the system, but unfortunately, in streamlining this system, a lot of the um, individual consumers got drug under. So because in your case, uh, Joe, you're the, you, if you're going like in New Hampshire, which is point of default, our last payment made, that would have taken years back to 2012. Uh, the statute of limitations in California for mortgages is six years. So that would mean we can go back to them and say, hey, you guys have no right to foreclose. Now, it doesn't kill the debt. The debt will still be attached to your house. But they have no right to foreclose, and they cannot continue to roll up interest on the debt. So it just sits there. So they have less of an incentive to go after you. That's the idea. But unfortunately, because of the, the marketable, the, the Records Title Act of, of 1982, what it says is that the power of the power of sale under a deed of trust never expires uh, if the maturity date is discernible for recording. It's 10 years. If it's not discernible, in other words, if on your uh, docs that were recorded with the county, if it doesn't give an end date to that loan, it's 60 years from the deed of trust. So 60 years plus six. So in your case, your loan was taken out, I think, in, uh, when was your loan originated that second, Joe? In 2005. Okay, so it would be, uh, 2000, it'd be 2000 and, 2071 that you would actually be able to time bar them from collecting. Now, I don't think that's reasonable. 
I do not think it is reasonable that a debt you took out in 2005 that laid fallow for 11 years and nobody said or did anything about was transferred to multiple different companies has only come back now that the statute of limitations on it doesn't actually run out until 2071. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, God willing, you and right. I will both see 2071, but to, to, to say that there is any effective uh, uh, restriction, time-barred restriction on collecting a, a mortgage debt in California just doesn't exist. Not unless the bank was dumb enough to, to put in the document that they filed with the county an end date, which they never, never do, or they try to do judicial for, a judicial foreclosure, which they never do, and it's up to the bank to do that. It's not up to the individual. So that's where that leaves us. And that's ridiculous. Seven, like 2071 is when your debt, when they will be time barred from collecting the debt on you, Jim. But not until then. So until then, you got to deal with them. And that's wrong. I, right. That's just ridiculous. And especially somebody who in your position, I mean, my goodness, you spent a lifetime in law enforcement, and then you got a real estate license as well, so it makes you, I mean, pretty credible, certainly well-educated on the topic. And you have done nothing all the, along the way, and you have the records to prove it, but absolutely the responsible thing at every turn, and yet here we are. That's, Correct. That so, is... you know, folks like myself that lived through the Great Recession are now living the, uh, uh, through a great deception. <laughs> that's a spectacular <laughs> turn of phrase, the Great Deception. I think we'll start calling it that. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's, that's very, very much on, on task. You should write copy. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, well, we'll, call it, we'll call it the Great Deception because that's what's happening, and they are coming out of the woodwork. And it's not just you know the arch mortgages of the world. It's Bob Smith who bought the loan in the secondary market. It's this, it's that, it's the other thing. And they just come out like crazy. Uh, and they come back to life to, to eat, your, eat your equity. It's ridiculous. I mean, if somebody like you, who is consistently done the right thing, who has consistently done the smart thing, who has consistently, as you like to put it, done your due diligence, um, and who has a, enough of a background in this to know a little about what they're talking about, knowing to, how to, to kind of you know, sift the truth from the, from the garbage out there, and yet you're still in this position? And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to bring you on the show. I mean, what hope does somebody who doesn't have your kind of background have? And I got friends who are real, I have, I have a friend who's a real estate attorney who's got one of these right now. And she absolutely knew better. And she also has all the documentation. Uh, it's just, it's absolutely obscene what is going on. The idea that you could just leave a debt alone on something as important as somebody's house for more than a decade and they just pop up and wave your hand and go, hey, uh, uh, it's like a bad where's Waldo. Hey, uh, I, Waldo's here, I want my money. I mean, that's, that's totally insane. That is totally insane. So I'm um, being waved at because I'm sorry, I got a little too minutes. We need to, we need to go to break. We need to hear from some more, um, some more advertisers. Joe, I want to thank you for calling in today. Is there anything else you want to tell people? Yeah, I just want to uh, let people know out there, you know, uh, call in and, and bring this, this subject to light because uh, after doing some of my research here, um, uh, uh, there's not too much talk about this, this dilemma, and, and it's going to get worse if we don't bring this to the attention of our legislators and politicians yeah. to intervene. Yeah. yeah, well, maybe we can. I mean, I've been at this forever, and so far it's been almost 30 years, and there's just no political will. There just isn't. Right. I mean, maybe that'll change as this gets worse. Maybe the more, more interest we can bring on it, maybe that'll change. But somebody in Sacramento has got to decide to take this on. Because what is currently allowed to happen in this state is wrong. It is just that simple. It is wrong. And it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. This is theft. That's what it is. It's the great deception, as I think we'll start calling it. It is legalized right. theft. So I want to thank you for calling in, Joe. I want to thank you for telling your story. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go to we're going to go to break now. Get some more advertisers in there, and we come back. I'm going to give you guys solutions to this problem. I promise you solutions. The last half of the show, we're doing solutions to zombie seconds and zombie debt. So please hang with us. I got the answers to your questions. I promise. I'm Rich Sherman. Thank you guys for listening. Hi there, guys. It's Rich Sherman. You've reached uh, the Real Estate Fix with Rich on KHTS 98.1 A. Oh, sorry, FM. AM 1220, your hometown station. As much as I say that, you think I'd be have a better handle on it. But thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for tuning in. We've been talking today all about zombie mortgages, wall-to-wall -wall zombie mortgage stuff today, because this is a topic that just bears more more conversation. We've got to get the word out there about this, because these things are dangerous and they are devastating. And more importantly, they're wrong. They shouldn't exist. It's just that simple. So I promise you guys solutions, and I have them here for you. So for those of you who hung in with the show, I appreciate it. For those of you guys who watch this on, on uh, YouTube or another uh, whatever service in the future, this is the part you want to get to uh, because we're going to talk about solutions. So the first thing I'm going to do is give you stuff that you need to do individually. And the second thing I'm going to do is talk about how we fix this problem once and for all. So and that has to do with legislation. Our legislators have to deal, legislators have to deal with that. So let's start here. How do we fix this uh, for the individual? So what you got to do is if you, first of all, look. 
go into your, go to a title person, go to a realtor, go to anybody, and just have them pull a copy of your title. Go to the county directly. Go to the assessor's office. Ask him for it. Call my office. By the way, my number, I haven't put it out yet, my number is 661-714-1400. That is my personal cell phone number, 661 714 one four zero zero. I give it out every week. Feel free to give me a call, preferably not while I'm on the air. Uh, if I don't answer, send me a text. I will. I will get back to you. I promise. I try to return all my calls in the 24 hours, if not faster. Even when I was in the hospital, I was still returning calls. Uh, I'll be happy to do that for you. But uh, the first thing to do is contact somebody and check. Hey, I had a second. I filed a bankruptcy. I think it was gone. Uh, I had a mechanics lien. I had a whatever lien on my house, and I did a modification. I thought it was gone. Or I haven't I haven't heard anything for a while. It must be gone. Check. Super easy. Just pull the title report. You'll see if it's there. You don't even need the full title report. All you need is, is the uh, profile, and you can find out exactly what's going on. And then a prelim after that if you need it. So it's easy enough. Call the title company directly. Call me. I'll get it for you. That takes 30 seconds. It's not a big deal. Please call. Second, uh, try contacting the customer service department of any title or escrow company. Ask them. If you don't want to ask me, ask them. There are also federal lending agencies such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You can contact them, ask them. Uh, there's also HUD. You can talk to them. Um, if you do find, if it does turn out you do have a zombie second and you cannot get a hold of anybody and nobody's contacting you, here's what you do. You set up, you get ahead of it. You set up a separate bank account, preferably non-interest bearing, a trust account. And what you do is you take what would be your, your payment for that and you put it in there every month. And you do that for two reasons. One, you'll build up a lot of money there so if they do come calling, you have it. Uh, and if they don't, you keep it as a savings account. And two, it demonstrates your ability and willingness to pay. So you're ready to go. They're not talking to you. That becomes a very, very important part of the defense if this has to go to court. And we try really hard to keep people out of court. But in like Joe's case that you just heard, I don't see how that's going to happen. Because B of A's attitude about this, his loan has been, hey, it's not our problem. We sold that loan years ago. Go talk to somebody else. And the United Guarantees attitude and Arch's attitude, Arch Mortgage's attitude is, hey, we bought the loan in good faith, not our problem. So everybody's busy passing the buck, and they're passing it all to Joe, and we're going to put a stop to that. But So it gets more complicated. So for yourself, check to see if you have one of these things. Check to see if it's still on your title. If it is, contact the lender. Say, hey, what's going on? Contact a title company. Ask what's going on. Contact me. Let's find out what's going on and see if we can fix it. You are always better off approaching them than waiting for them to approach you. Even if you can't find them, you're better off doing that. Also, as far as resources, uh, and of course, before I get off this, real estate attorney, also good issue with real estate attorneys is they're going to charge you. Uh, they're going to charge you for a lot of stuff that I'm happy to do for free that you can do for free. Uh, I shouldn't say all real estate attorneys. My wife is a real estate attorney. I have other attorneys in as part of our group. And I love attorneys. But, you know, their, their time is valuable and they get paid for their time. Uh, my time is also valuable, but I do this for free because I'm, I don't know, insane. It's a crusade. It's I like charging windmills. What can I tell you? Uh, anyway, also, you can talk to a couple of agencies, a couple of places, websites, great stuff. The CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, you can check with them. They've got a lot of great information on it. You can check with um, a site called Housing Hermes, H-E-R-M-E-S, Hermes, I guess. Uh, also a very good website. The NHRC, the National Housing Research Center, They their, their videos tend to be a little on the long side, I'll warn you. Uh, but they are great, and they are very, very good, and I think it's worth investing an hour, hour and a half of your time if your home is in danger. Uh, I think they're fantastic. I'm a very big fan of the NHRC. Uh, also, First Tuesday, which is a strange, strange website. It's called First Tuesday. It's a strange name. It's usually for realtors. A lot of great information there. Or uh, SRR, the Board of Realtors, the Southland Regional Association of Realtors. Go to their website. They'll help you out. There are a lot of resources out there, uh, resources out there but you got to get to them. Now, before we end the show, I want to get to this because we're going to wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, here's how we end them permanently. Uh, I was lucky enough to be at the center of kind of a working group we put together about five, six years ago, seven years ago, with attorneys and people from the mortgage industry, uh, realtors, myself. We kind of headed it up with my, uh, my friend Lou Esmond. And we came up with three things. If these three things were changed, zombie seconds would go away. Zombie mortgages would cease to exist in the state of California, like waving a magic wand. It would kill all the zombies. Here are the three things. Number one, notice of transfers of lien holders should be constructive. In other words, when a bank transfers a loan from bank A to bank B, in Joe's case, from Bank of America United Guarantee, and this is where United Guarantee blew it, the law on the subject is they are supposed to give Joe notice. And I promise you they didn't. The problem is we can't prove a negative. You cannot prove that Joe didn't get that notice. So it should be on them. It should be constructive. In other words, Bank of America or United Guarantee should have to prove that they gave Joe notice. It shouldn't be Joe's job to tell them. Also, notice of current lien holders should be filed with the county. You should know who has your loan, and it should be filed with the county. It shouldn't be hard to find out who owns the loan. Joe didn't even know that United Guarantee owned his loan until he got a, a letter from another company. And this is the most important one. 
The property owner should have the right to buy the lien in the secondary debt market just like the debt buyers do at the same discounted rate. If a debt buyer can buy your $100,000 loan for five grand, you should have the right to do that too. It shouldn't be the debt holder, the debt buyer gets it for five grand and then turns around and tries to enforce a $100,000 debt on you. That's wrong. Those three things, make notice constructive, make sure that whoever holds the lien is filed with the county so you know who has your mortgage, and allow the person, if it goes into the secondary market, allow the owner to buy the dang thing. That's it. Those three simple things, no more zombie mortgages. I'm Rich. You've been listening to The Real Estate Fix with Rich on KHTS. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for the privilege of your time. If you have any questions, give me a call. Contact me through the station. We fix these things all the time. Thank you guys. You have a great week.